Uh, kia ora. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, the, yeah, the title of my talk today is um, Learning to Cope with Galleries at Auckland War Memorial Museum. So the, the cope element that I'm focusing on today is how to use 3D scanning technologies to, um, <coughs> to, um, to record and preserve, um, preserve our galleries, and also how to um, tell new stories about them or take those experiences out to, um, to, to visitors and students in, in situations that, that better suit them. Okay, so the, the three gallery scan case studies I'm going to focus on today um, uh, the Auckland 1866, which kind of started it all off. Um, touch a little bit on Gallipoli and Minecraft before um, concentrating a bit more on the Origins Gallery and tell a bit of a um, learning and education, learning and engagement story. Sorry, Josh. Okay, so kicking all off with um, Centennial Street, um, Auckland 1866. So um, the, ch the challenge here was t um, we had a, um, a, a, a much loved gallery that, um, that was coming to the end of its life and we were very interested in um, capturing some um, architectural plans for it. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you're, anybody's aware of the, the history of this gallery, but it was created back in 1966 by a department store in, in, um, in Auckland down on Queen Street. Uh, known as Milne and Choice, and so it, it exists. The set kind of existed there um, for a time before it was donated up to um, Auckland Museum, and then it became a, a permanent gallery from from that point on. Um, so obviously, the, with, with the need to, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. So, so those were the, um, the the chief challenges that we were were wanting to address here. That um, working up those architectural plans, uh, preserving gallery layout, and maybe as a bit of an added bonus, um, thinking about a, a digital tour. Um, so just taking a little stop there, just, um, sorry, a little stop there just um, to go back to a bit of um, inspiration for, for the type of project and uh, well, gallery scanning project that we were wanting to undertake My for this. My name's David Rooney, I'm the Science Museum's Curator of Transport. The Ship and Galleries opened at the Science Museum in 1963. It's the biggest gallery space in the museum and it was stuffed full over a thousand absolutely remarkable exhibits. Genuinely historic stuff. Every time I walked through, I found something I'd never seen before. After half a century though, it was time to close the doors. It was time to make way for new exhibits. But we wanted some way to preserve the old shipping galleries. And I was really excited when we got the chance to have the whole display laser scanned. Two billion precisely measured points and so now we can make a virtual model of the galleries. We can see them in an entirely new way. It's a unique permanent record of a unique historic exhibition. It lets us... So that was very much what we were, we were wanting to do with Auckland 1866, so create a unique permanent record, but also to, to um, reverse engineer those, those architectural plans. There were, there, were, there were no plans available to us that, that came through from um, 1966. So that's why we're, we chose to um, <coughs> work with a, a team of architects to uh, carry out those laser scans. And uh, the other side of that is once we had those, those laser scans, that once the exhibition came off display and was in storage, then at a later date, would we be able to rebuild it? We'd be able to put, a, put parts of back together for um, complementary displays, either at Auckland Museum or, or elsewhere at other institutions. Um, and now touching again on another little bit of, um, of inspiration for this. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier there, one of, one of the little um, serendipitous outcomes we were hoping for perhaps was, was a, um, a digital tour that might come out of out of this. So there's, here's this um, Google, really lovely, well-produced Google um, tour of the Abbey Road recording studio. <clears throat> I've got this, this fantastic intro, but what, we, um, but what we loved in particular was once you got inside that, um, take note of that, that um, on the bottom left-hand corner of that navigation aid, um, what we really liked is you, the, the visitor could go through points, lead their own journey through the gallery and call out um, points of interest and get more information on those. They could also um, easily navigate around, around the space and, and quickly move to points of interest. 
So that so that um, so that was the challenge. So the opportunity was to that, that, uh, to address those challenges was to um, work with a team of architects to create those um, those plans. And the, the method we um, that the architects chose was um, laser scanning. Um, they also did some um, um, photo stitching um, or setting a camera up in the gallery and doing some photo stitching. But but the laser scan was um, really well suited to the creation of those architectural plans. Um, and as you'll see in a video coming up, there was also the ability to kind of create um, an opportunity to create uh, an actor-led experience to, um, w within the gallery. So we'll get to that. So this, this video j will just take us through um, the, a kind of a comparison between the laser scanning of Auckland 1866 and, and swap between um, um, the, the photo stitching as well. As you can see, there's that kind of that, that really atmospheric layer there from, that you get from, from the laser scanning, all those, all those wonderful point clouds and lasers that are getting all that, accurately capturing that record of, of the gallery. And then as we move in here, I think it'll swap over to the photos. And so at the end of that, that scanning exercise, we'd successfully created those new plans. These are, these are the, the, the reverse engineered architectural plans that we got back from, from the architects. And um, so, it's, so we've got that, those little plans and then that, that layering of, the, of the, um, the atmosphere over top as well. So now, so, so the, the valuable thing about this is, of course, from the scanning, we've got a record that the museum can keep forevermore. And this little video, <coughs> um, this little video is then that, that second stage of the exercise. So um, w with a, a more of a, a photo stitching approach, we we're able to capture the, the gallery so mo people can move through it more of a, a Google style, um, a Google style tour. But we were also we also worked with our learning and engagement team to create um, a, an actor led um, experience. So we had two actors that were that that created fictionalised accounts of, of personalities from two of the retail spaces within 1866 and, and um, uh, created, created backstories for those. Um, so we captured them and they were also there on site for the, for the closing, closing weekend. So just, uh, this is the little, so as you can see. Good afternoon, ma'am. Feel free to have a look around it. So there's lots of fantastic work going into the script writing for that the actor-led experience and also capturing that and then layering that within this, this Google-style 3D um, tour. And then you can see that, that um, navigation aid in the, in the left-hand corner that's, that's calling back to that, that um, Abbey Road tour. Um, there's, there's, and again, back to the Abbey Road, there's, there's, this gallery is just jam-packed full of, full of objects um, and stories, so um, the, the shop fronts and the objects, or key shop fronts and key objects within the gallery uh, are tappable, and then um, visitors can get more information on those. Um, there's really fantastic photography going on, so visitors can really zoom in and see a lot of detail there. And once that, and, and that tour exists online at the moment, so that's Auckland1866aucklandmuseum.com. Um, I can put those links up later. Um, but then that becomes this, this fantastic tour that then provides um, context for um, the collection stories that we have on the, on the rest of the site. So this is just one of our, our many um, fantastic topic pages that provide a bit of a, um, a bit of a um, introduction to the breadth of the Auckland Museum's collection, and this one's focusing on objects of colonial Auckland. And then we're able to embed that, that tour within that so people can see, get a bit more of a sense of um, how these objects are made, created, and, and were used in, the, in Auckland at the time. So just um, wrapping up the outcome of that, that case study, um, it really fulfilled the objects of the of, of the, the objectives of the pilot. So we, we got those fantastic um, architectural plans that we can keep forever, um, and added added bonus, um, we um, we got that uh, digital tour created on top of that. Um, we were able to extend a digitisation project into something far more engaging with 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 a storytelling uh, uh, component embedded within it. 
So just moving um, on to the next case study. Now, some of you might have heard a lot about Gallipoli and Minecraft. We've talked about it a few times, so I promise you I won't, I won't dwell on it too much. But it proved a little bit of a turning point within, um, um, for us with the 3D scanning technology. Um, uh, this is where we'd um, come into contact with the firm that was um, dealing with technology called Matterport. Um, if anybody's um, familiar with it, um, I must here correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Matterport's um, a technology that's uh, made its name, well, it's based in the US, it's made its name within the real estate industry. <coughs> um, it's a very cost effective means and quick means of going into a house and, and capturing um, uh, the, the whole 3D layout of the house that then can be put online and people can, can view through, um, go, go on um, their own vis <coughs> excuse me, visits of houses at, the, at their leisure. Um, so we decided to, so with Gallipoli and Minecraft, we decided to give um, Matterport a try on that to see if, if it was a good, um, a good use of the technology, um, if it, if it um, captured the gallery in, in a way that we really liked. Um, so, so we conducted a pilot, compared that with the, the different technologies we've been using up until this stage, and yeah, assess if it was the best, best product for scanning. Um, all right. We touched on Matterport there, a little bit of background. So, so the outcome of that, <coughs> let's say, um, it was, um, for us it was a fairly new technology, um, but, but a really promising one. It, it's, it's, um, the firm behind it is, is bringing in new features all the time. So there, um, when we first started dealing with it, there wasn't the, that big opportunity to kind of layer more text and those embedded elements within it, like we did with 1866 but more of that is being developed and, um, and brought online with, with revisions of the product. Um, we found it to be um, reasonably cost effective. Um, another bonus is it supports um, virtual reality right out of the box, um, which we'll, I'll point to in, in one of the upcoming videos. So these Google Cardboard and, and um, other devices, you, you can get straight into the scans using those. Um, as I say, there are a few options to layer content, but that's improving. Um, one of the downsides for us is though there are, there's no original files to, to get hold of. Um, so if a, we are a little bit at the mercy of the vendor, so if they do go away, then there's potential to lose that. On to the Origins Gallery. Um, so um, something I probably didn't um, preview up front. What I'm really trying to tell here with the story is that it's, it, it's very much like a, a future museum story for us. A future museum uh, for Auckland Museum is a, is a guiding 20-year strategy. And one of the components of that is to um, spread digital thinking and digital capability out from the digital team to all teams around the museum. Um, so, so this story going through these cases is very much um, going from technical pilot to a situation where um, teams outside of digital can um, work on their own digital experience, digital product, and um, work directly with the vendor and, and um, own that and develop that themselves. So Origins very much, the, the story behind the Origins Gallery very much sits within that. So the, the Origins Gallery, <coughs> the challenge for us, well, the challenge for our learning engagement team was um, at, at one stage that they're teaching modules within the gallery. That's modules the right word, Josh? No programs. Program. They're, they're che teaching programs within the gallery, um, but finding that the gallery is not really adapted for learning. There's, there's, there's various problems they're encountering with, with noise, traffic flow, and visitor comfort. So we'll di dive into those challenges um, now one by one. So a big one is noise. I mean, there's lots of dinosaurs in this gallery. Kids love dinosaurs. So th this program in question is being aimed at uh, secondary school students, and there's lots of noise being generated by um, uh, younger children. There's, there's lots of gallery congestion um, in, in this gallery. There's, um, there's self-led school groups. There's um, uh, tour groups going through. Um, there's, there's general public going through. Um, so it's, it's really hard for the educators to um, find space, find quiet space within the gallery to, to conduct the program. And as I say, they're, they're dealing with, with secondary school children and um, uh, secondary school students, um, some, of, some of which are bigger than others. And it's really hard if, if um, we're focusing on one, one particular case within this gallery, it's a tight space, so it's hard to, hard to get those um, 
get those groups uh, located with you know sitting on the floor. They're older kids; they, they don't they want to be sitting on the floor anymore. Okay, so the opportunity then for the, for the for the Origins Gallery was to do, do a Matterport scan of this, um, and then kind of linking into what um, which Foy was saying this morning about taking this experience back out to the back out to the students. So putting it in a space or delivering it in a method that, that best, best suits them um, um, into a situation where it's easier for um, the educator to connect the gallery and, and the collection and the, and the objects um, and to engage with the, the learners. So this is just a quick video of that, that scan. Um, as you can see down here, there's that, um, you know, it's, it's available in the, with the the virtual reality of the Google Cardboard can easily toggle between um, dollhouse and um, floor plan. This is the MOA case here, so they can go straight to that, that MOA case. Um, easily navigate around the, uh, around the gallery themselves. And then when they come back to the gallery, and this, sorry, back to the MOA case, <coughs> sort of honing in on the example that. Um, for, for the educators, so say here that they're trying to um, talk to the students about um, morphological difference between um, moa species, and and talking about those differences, um, how those differences are represented with the, with the leg bones there and the, and the different sized skeletons. So here's Josh. <laughs> say hi, Josh. This is Josh, our educator from Auckland Museum. Um, he leads leads this particular program. So this is this is Josh taking through the the the, hot, the class in Auckland Museum's classroom. We we have two built-in classrooms on site. So he's he's going through that um, that interactive that I just showed you. He's he's leading it with with the um, with the iPad there. Um, and so he's able to take take the whole group through, and 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 easily swap backwards and forwards between the elements he's trying to point out in the gallery with, with the handling collection there. Um, um, and so then the next step then is that ability to really engage with the learners. So, from, so they were able to easily move from that um, uh, educators speaking to the whole group to um, cutting up into smaller groups. So there's smaller groups of four to five children, work, uh, work students working with um, iPads, and then that they're um, able to work together in a kind of co-constructed learning. So, so they're, they're able to navigate themselves around, um, around the gallery. Um, they're sitting down, so they're able to um, um, safely and easily work with those, those, um, those, those objects. That moa bone was, was a real moa bone. So, they can easily pass that around um, safely and, and, and link that back to what's going on in the, in the gallery tour. Um, they're, they're also able to, no, I've forgotten the phrase now. Um, bring in the learning. Um, working, in those, working in those groups together, in those smaller groups, they're, all, they're able to draw on their prior knowledge from, from other areas of biology or or just general knowledge to, to um, kind of really break away from that 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 authoritative voice from one one educator one teacher telling them telling them about the topic to helping themselves work through through a topic with reference to the, to that handling collection and to the gallery and easily um, being able to swap backwards and forwards between the two. So just going to the, just wrapping up with the outcome for that that origins gallery. Um, um, we, we've, we've noticed there's some um, improved visitor, visitor engagement, um, we have a little bit of reduced feedback from teachers about that noise, because obviously after they've, they've gone through this classroom exercise, they're able then to go on their own um, self-led um, uh, visit through the gallery themselves, so the teacher takes the class themselves through the gallery. And then they're already, already prepared for the gallery, they've already been prepped, have that, that knowledge, so we're finding them more engaged once they get into the gallery. They know what objects they're looking and they've got that background information. Um, so it's really encouraging students to look closer at the objects, both in that classroom situation, but once they get out into the, into the gallery. Um, students really responded well to the ability to lead themselves through 
um, a learning exercise. Um, though um, learning engagement teams are still very keen that there's an expert there to, um, to help prepare the class and lead them through and explain some of those key concepts to, to link back to the curriculum. Um, so, we, so all in all, found um, it's a really use, um, this, this whole 3D scanning technology has been turned into a really usable tool that's um, added value um, to, to the students themselves, who it's improved their visitor experience, but also really helped um, with the educators to take, take the class through in a more detailed way. So, um, so just wrapping up there. So, as I say, this is this is really a story of moving from a technical pilot to um, a standard piece of digital practice that any team, not just a digital team, um, can um, can take up and lead. And and that last example, I think, is kind of is my favourite um, case study in the whole one because it. It's one that, that didn't involve the digital team. Um, um, the, the previous pilots started off as, as, as technical pilots. Um, they evolved, but evolved into valuable tools over time. Um, digital team was uh, um, involved in evaluating it, found it useful. Um, so we sort of paved that way. But, um, but then, yeah, it's really been something that, that's been owned by the learning engagement team. Now it's a standard part of what not only that team does, but the muse museum as a whole. So it's, it's, um, some, it's a tool we consider as part of our gallery renewal process. Um, when exhibitions come to an, an end, um, scanning those exhibitions so we've got a permanent record of those. And of course, that great learning story. So, so thank you very much, everybody. I hope um, there's some, um, some takeaways that you have got from that. And um, perhaps I'm a bit happy to um, talk through um, after the talk or at a break about how they might be able to pick some of this up for your own situations, your own organisations. Thank you. Well, thanks, Gareth. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. So does anyone have any questions for Gareth at all? Yep, there's one at the back. And um, we have a microphone, so. So amazing. And as an educator, it excites me so much. But um, I was just wondering, when you were looking for the people to do the work, mm. was there millions of people to choose from, or is there only a few companies that actually do the 3D scanning? And, you know, was that easy or hard? Or? Um, I think, the, Niels, do you want to talk to that one? Um. <laughs> Niels was involved early on in, in the kind of scoping out that, that landscape for the, um, the, the firms that were that they are out there doing that, and then it kind of moved over into a content production phase. Um, so as, as Gary was saying before, it is sort of an architectural discipline, or, or f like a surveying tool, really. So there's quite a few um, contestors in that market space that we could choose from, and it was just completely coincidental that the people that we've worked with there had the capability to do 3D scanning in Tetlo, you should really try this. Um, so there was there was an opportunity for us, but there is there's many um, sort of companies um, operating in that space. Um, and then, as Gareth also said, um, there um, increasingly there are there are um, businesses that work in, in, in sort of the real estate um, field as well, which are probably not to that same level of of um, detail and precision as the architectural ones, um, but are much quicker in the way they turn around things. And we were lucky to, to um, work with a company in Auckland um, who we've, we had a relationship with and, and they, they're really kind of front-footing that technology and, and, and it was a great opportunity for us to, to kind of walk that journey with them together. But I think it's just going to increase and we're going to see more of it. And that said, the hardware itself is also quite affordable if, if you wanted to do yeah. it yourself. Like tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands? Or the hardware? Um, <laughs> probably around $5,000 would get you in, in the game to... to, to be like $10,000? $20,000? No, I think it's... Yeah, so, it's, you know, it's, it's affordable-ish, but not affordable enough for us to go out and... and, and just buy it and, and do it ourselves. Question. Meredith. Uh, how, big, how big is the Auckland Museum's digital team? How many people are um, <laughs> devoted to pursuing digital realm stuff? Um, 
Most of us are here at the conference today. Quite a few of us in this room. Um, we're, how big is the digital team? We're, we're about uh, six people. Um, but as I kind of touched on the talk, it, it's very much about uh, we've been through like about a year long project of of taking digital capability out to other teams and and, and making digital a normal part of what they do. So yeah. We kind of, I think, kind of punch above our weight for, for six people. Um, but, yeah, we wouldn't be able to do it with, without, without all the help and expertise from, from teams throughout the museum uh, learning engagement in particular. Go, Josh. Go, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. There's a mic coming. Uh, was, there, was there any uh, hesitation in using Matterport, given that you don't seem to kind of get the data at the end of it? <laughs> right there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is a problem for me. Um, I, I like to have all control of all the assets. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's, we're bringing a, a digital asset management system online um, later this year, so we want to make that a normal part of what we do for any digital project, any exhibition content-related project that you've got you've got the assets right there from the start. I mean, it's something that we're asking more and more uh, when we're going to third party vendors if they're developing an interactive for us. We want that, we, maybe we can't recode stuff, but we want the assets so we can go in and make those lightweight text and image edits, because it's just too expensive to go back out again and, and do that. So where possible, we always want the original stuff, yeah. But in regards to the actual scanner being created and pertinent, uh, <laughs> I think there is a possibility to export a little bit of the actual raw and pretty yeah. files. It doesn't have the experiential side to it, so the actual you know, ability to navigate and oh. stuff, but you do get the raw model. Oh, okay. But we yeah, haven't done it yet. They're very controlled, and they want to hold all the data. And that's where it stumps us, because we don't, as a supplier, we can't supply that. Mm -hmm. um, because they want to hold all the, it's all about Go. Any other questions? Actually, we've got one more minute, so this is the final question from Adrian, just in the front there. Thanks. Who else put their hand up and I'll come and find yeah. them afterwards? Cool. Come on. It actually follows on um, from, from that. So, Manaport we kind of talked about, but the others, so you talked about having an archive of exhibitions, but what's the long-term um, prognosis of, of the files that you're collecting? So in terms of the digital preservation of what it is that you're doing, you're doing some fairly, maybe not cutting edge, but more complex no. digital files. So for the investment and everything, it's great that you can get architectural models, but what about the actual 3D themselves? Yeah. It oh, well, is it even a consideration, I guess, is, is the thing? Yeah, of course it's a consideration. Um, I guess we're, bit, we're quite at the early stages of it, so... We're still kind of testing out what's possible, and in this phase, it's 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 been more about that, um, yeah, creating those cool customer experiences, like working working with L and E. Um, we've wrapped up a um, uh, one I haven't touched on as a, a recent exhibition that closed, Kurora Mai Kurora Atu, um, and there's a chance to um, link to art. Murray Art um, practice curriculum links and that. So I, I guess it's something we do need to think more about, that, that whole preservation side of it, but right now we've been focusing on the experience. But yeah, I think it's a fair, fair call. Just on that point, um, so the dance is... The dance... Hello, how are you? No, no. Good to see you. The dam system that we're about to put into place supports 3D files, so we will be able to keep a permanent 3D record um, of those scans, not really knowing what we're going to be doing with it, but we, we will we will keep a record of it, and that's both for sort of <laughs> reference back of house purposes that we can go back to, to to things that we've done in the past, or maybe even rebuild some things that we've done in the past, like 8066, if that's what we wanted to do, or to build uh, uh, experiences on top of it. But um, we, we have the ability to store it. We have the ability to create. We have the ability to store it. And what comes after, we'll see. Cool. And uh, a quick plug for Meredith's talk later this afternoon. She'll be talking about um, object scanning within galleries at, at Nelson Provincial Museum.
check it out.